Joachim Joachim Johansson always contact. We'll talk about Sarah Atmata. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, welcome everyone to the seminar of today. Yes, uh, like we said earlier, I'm Simon, and I'm here with Joachim and August today. So, uh, in today's natural science, mathematical equations uh, is a fundamental concept. All in here as future engineers and scientists. Uh, were taught and uh, trained in how to use mathematics to describe all the natural systems occurring around us. But is the system of mathematics sufficient to describe all the complex phenomena occurring in the world we live in? One guy who think this is not the case is this guy. You might recognize him as Stephen Wolfram. He's the, the creator of uh, Mathematica and also the president of Wolfram Research. He means that the, the system of mathematics is a very very limited system and it's doomed to be a science in the future. Uh, in 2002, he published this book here. Uh, it's called A New Kind of Science. It's over 1,200 pages uh, long and uh, as you call itself, uh, a masterpiece. Um, and in this book, uh, he describes what he thinks is the shortcomings of mathematics. Uh, and he also proposes a, a new appro approach to science. Uh, he has an idea and a theory he claims is more general than mathematics. Uh, and with the ability to describe far more phenomena occurring around us and uh, even explain the whole existence of our universe. And that's what we are going to talk about today. We're going to try to describe all the, yeah, the basic concepts of, uh, in the book. Uh, so we're going to talk some about uh, the idea of simple programs. We're going to describe a little bit about a cellular automata. Then we're going to explain how these ideas can, could be implemented in the fields of biology, philosophy, and also physics. Okay, but if we start to look at the mathematics as we use it today, the modern mathematics, where does it come from? Uh, one can say that uh, it's originated from the late 17th century and Isaac Newton. Uh, he then published his book, it's called uh, Principa, uh, and it was basically, basically from, from this book uh, that uh, Catalyst was born, and uh, concepts like functions, like derivatives, and integrals, integrals were all introduced, which are all fundamental concepts in today's modern mathematics. And after this, mathematics was started to be in, implemented in other uh, fields of science, like most uh, most success is probably had in physics, where all major theories based on uh, mathematical uh, equations. And throughout the year, it also gained success in chemistry, biology, and economic, economics, and other areas as well. With the evolution of mathematics, it's, uh, the idea also came that uh, mathematics is considered an exact science, and uh, like the, the system we live in, all the system occurring around us, uh, is all governed by law specified by mathematical equations. But this idea is something that uh, Wolfram argues against. Yeah, as I said, he, he means like the mathematical system to describe the systems is uh, very limited. Um, it means it's just a human artifact. Uh, and it can only be used to explain s simple systems and simple problems. That one might say, like, yeah, we use mathematics for everything and it's explained a lot of stuff. Uh, but then, in the book, he argues, like, um, uh, it just means, like, the question that's been asked to science has just been addressed in the way that mathematical system has uh, allowed us to address the, the questions uh, and 
it means there's a lot of more questions out there that has not even been addressed to be solved by mathematics. Uh, and this certainly worked out well for Newton and other scientists when they were trying to compute like the orbits of planets and other simple systems like that. That's how Wolfram puts it. But it also means like most of the system that's around us are not these kind of uh, simple system. They're more complex and show more complex behaviors. And then just mathematics just fails to explain this and you, you can't use that system. This might be like all the formation of patterns in, in nature, of plants and animals, like the shape of a snowflake. And also stuff like continental drift, uh, turbulent fluid flows, and the evolution by natural selection. And much other stuff. Which Wolfram claims all cannot be explained by mathematics. Uh, so how could it be explained and what's his idea? He has this idea about uh, uh, in science based on um, simple programs and, and new kind of science. So it means that all systems at some level must operate by some rules, some abstract rules, but they cannot be uh, defined in a mathematical construct invented by humans, uh, such as numbers, exponentials. This is just too complicated. It must must be something more simpler. Uh, yeah, and this is his kind of argument for using simpler, simp simpler rules. Uh, and then one might say if you have simple rules, you can't get uh, complicated, complex behaviors. But you mean that's not the case. Even simple rules can get uh, emergent, <coughs> complex behaviors. This is in contrast, like the engineering approach, a programming approach, where you, you want a compli complicated behavior, you just do more complicated <coughs> systems, or you have more complicated programs, but that doesn't need to be the case. Yeah, because then you have to put a lot of into to the system to get out a lot of complexity, but with just simple rules, you just have to put in simple rules and still get out a lot of complexity. And the reason or how Wolfram discovered it is mostly because of the evolution of um, computational uh, advances where he could, yeah, he built his own uh, programming language, the Mathematica, where he could uh, explore these different kinds of simple programs and then saw that, yeah, this you know, give rise to complex behaviors and that's kind of where he started his ideas. So, how could a system of simple programs look like? Uh, one system that's frequently used in, in the book is uh, Celer Automata. And this yeah, very um, system based on very simple rules, uh, we has as an uh, example throughout the whole book. So, we're going to see how a Celer Automata works and how, yeah, we am going to explain some more about it. So here we have the kind of the simplest Celer Automata, just a one-dimensional uh, case. Um, so here you see this, the rules, or the simple rules that uh, the system operates by. Uh, so each row here in, in the picture is like, um, yeah, the, the, the system at a certain time, and you evolve it through, through time, through each, each row at a different time. And the rules are specified here, so what the next color should be of the bit is governed by uh, the color of the, the previous bit and its two neighbors. Uh, so here's kind of one kind of rule. When you evolve it through time, you get uh, the behavior you can see up here on the pictures. So in the simplest case, when you just have uh, two different states a bit can be in, and it just looks at the two neighbors, you get 256 different combinations. But if you start to uh, add uh, different, uh, more states or more neighbors, this will increase very rapidly. So just by um, adding one more color for say, you can have a gray color as well, you will have a 10 to the power of 12 different uh, rules. So here you can 
see all the 256 different rules and all the behaviors that uh, shows up. And in the book, Wolfram created a system to classify these uh, different kinds of server automata in four different classes. First one is just repetition, where you, when you evolve the system, you get a very um, yeah, regular pattern. And it's like the one over here. Class number one. And uh, class number two, you get a, a nesting, it's called. So you get a self-similar uh, pattern and a fractal structure. And then we have class number three that's just called randomness. So from the <coughs> rules you evolve the system and it will just show uh, random behavior. There's no st structure anywhere, just random. And the class number four is localized structure. When you evolve the system you get some structures, but different structures in different places. And it's mostly class three and class four that's most interesting in using the book. And probably the, the favorite rule of Wolfram is rule 30. That's the, from class three, a random system. Here you see the rules. And when you evolve it, it just show random patterns. So it's arguing here that this simple rule still get a, the emergent of behavior of a, just randomness. Which he claims then is kind of a proof of how what simple rules can give rise to complex behaviors. And probably his second favorite uh, rule he has is rule 110. That's the localized structure. You see the rule, and when it was evolved, you see there's some structures here. There's some structures going on here, and here's something kind of random. And yeah, he also uses this. This, this rule can explain different things. So, but how could the, the rules be used and how could you describe systems in the real world with this? So, I'm going to pass on to you again, man. I'm just going to talk about that. Okay, so, like most other fields of science, Wolfram feels that biology uh, is something that his new kind of science can contribute to in some way. And he has the feeling that, well, biology still haven't been able to explain the complexity and, uh, and patterns and uh, like behaviors that you see in nature that the only thing they have to explain uh, this complexity is evolution. Uh, that when you see some kind of complex pattern, uh, that pattern is the most optimal solution to, well, to some kind of problem. Um, and that's the reason for it to look very complex. But it feels that this is not really the case, uh, and that biologists need to understand that from his book, uh, complexity can arise from simple rules. So when you see a complex pattern, he claims that that might not be some kind of optimization. It might just be that that pattern is the most, well, it was a very simple rule generating a pattern. So it came up entirely well, by random or through some random mutation. Uh, and it managed to survive. So that when you see complexity, it doesn't have to be some kind of optimal uh, way. One very obvious example of something similar to cellular automata, is this pattern on the mollusk shell here. Uh, it looks very similar to rule 30 uh, cellular automaton. And then he would claim then that the pattern on this shell is not perhaps the most optimal way to camouflage uh, the mollusk in any way. It just happened to be a very simple rule, as we can see that it is a simple rule generating this, because the, uh, the shell grows one-dimensionally uh, outwards, and then that would make a pattern uh, quite uh, probable to come up with that kind of pattern in the same way as all the other patterns we saw earlier. Um, but why does he feel that this is the explanation? Why couldn't complexity evolve like he thinks biology is? Bio biologists think. Um, well, he claims that well, complexity is very hard to optimize. If you have one population where the length of an animal is the most optimal, then uh, that population will converge to having around that length because individuals that are longer or shorter they will be penalized for this and will not have the same chance of survival. But if there's a very complex uh, structure evolving from, from the simple program and you manage to uh, mutate a small bit of, a, of the program, it will be a completely different uh, result. So when you change a little bit, it will be something entirely different. And he claims that this 
is what brings about a diversity in nature as well. So, for example, I think it has a lot of examples in this chapter. Uh, when you look at different seashells, it's not only the patterns on them, it's also the shapes that you see a lot of different, uh, well, shapes. And, uh, and you think that, okay, this is maybe a lot of diversity, that this uh, mollusks, whatever it is, it might have evolved to, to become in this shape because that's the most optimal way. But he finds that it's just a very small mutation from having that to having that. And he shows it by making a computer model and, of course, Mathematica, uh, where you can see that, okay, it grows uh, from this part. If it grows a little faster on that side compared to the other side, it will start to curve. And then depending on how much it curves, then it will create all these different shapes. And that then it's that the explanation for the diversity and for, for the complexity in, uh, in the shapes. Uh, he shows as well for leaves that you can see a lot of different shapes. It might not be that that shape is best for gathering sunlight on, on that uh, tree, perhaps, according to Wolfram. Uh, but it might be that you have a, a couple of simple rules that you modify a little bit and you get all the different shapes. So what is the critique against um, against all this. There's a lot of reviews on this book, and not all of them are positive. Um, well, one thing that I had noticed when I started to read that, this chapter is that he, he usually claims many think this and that uh, in the end notes, which at least have some kind of references, but usually not anyway. Uh, he says that, okay, during my discussions with biologists, they seem to try to explain the complexity by evolution. Um, but he doesn't really state any uh, research trying to uh, to explain it this way or anything like that, and it makes it really hard to understand if it's really uh, if these ideas are really revolutionary, if he has made an impact in the field or not. Uh, it seems like he doesn't really have that. Uh, and then also, natural selection is not really like he states a random search for the most global optima that you try to optimize everything. It's well, it tries to get. Well, usually it gets better through, through evolution, but since you've taken the stochastic optimization course, it's more likely that you get stuck on some global or oh, some local optima. Uh, it's more that, okay, if you have a, an offspring and it doesn't die, then it will survive. Uh, so it's not really trying to optimize uh, in the same way that he makes it sound like that, I would say. One of the reviews also uh, from Cosma Chelsea uh, says a very um, interesting thing that if you think that you have explained why leopards have spots just after coming up with, with a toy model of uh, producing spots, it will not occur to you to ask why leopards have spots, but polar bears do not, uh, which is to say that you will be simply blind to the whole problem of biological uh, adaption. And he really states that, okay, Wolfram doesn't really understand how evolution works, um, and just because you have a model that can produce spots, it doesn't explain why uh, certain animal has spots. So he makes it sound like he has explained the whole issue, but perhaps he hasn't. Uh, but that's about biology. There's a lot of other fields as well that he tries to improve. Um, he has some issues with philosophy as well. Uh, and he feels that, okay, philosophers, they haven't really explained why there is free will. Um, but with his new kind of science, uh, he can explain it. Uh, we'll see if you <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, but his idea of it is basically that, okay, free will is, basic, is me not being sure if you will make this decision or that decision. Um, and therefore I think that you have free will. And he compares it to, of course, the cellular automata, uh, that if you watch it evolve, it's a little hard to determine if it's going to go left or right. Um, but if you understand how the cellular automata works, you can look at the rules and see that, okay, this is still a deterministic process, but it looks like the, it almost has a will of its own when it moves. And therefore, it tries to get to the conclusion that, okay, then you are able to explain free will because it looks like uh, that has a will of its own and it looks like a person has a will of its own, but then uh, still the neurons, if you knew exactly how the neurons work and so on, you would see that it was a deterministic process, uh, and that would explain free will. I have tried to find some philosopher commenting on this, uh, I haven't been able to do that, but it seems like philosophy, okay, some 
philosophers think of determinism and some do not, uh, but it doesn't seem like it has revolutionized the field either. Um, but onto a subject that you might be more familiar with, uh, <coughs> about physics. Yes, so now we'll uh, talk about an example regarding physics, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about complexity. Uh, since Stephen is trying to find this tool that explains everything, uh, of course, uh, laws of physics need to be, needs to be explained. Uh, and it starts with to say that according to, uh, a, to a good approximation, the underlying laws of physics are time reversal invariant. And this means that even a sufficient precise knowledge of the present state is possible to know what it, a physical system will do in the future, but also what it did in the past. However, there are contradictions. Uh, one of them is the second law of thermodynamics, which states that uh, systems starting in a regular but organized state become progressively more random and disorganized. And this phenomenon Wolfram wants to explain with his cell automatas. So this picture here shows a reversible cell automata. Basically, it is possible to uh, go backwards and trace what rule gave rise to this pattern. And the picture shows uh, these black boxes here represent particles moving inside this box and they bounce on the walls and also collide with each other. Uh, and, but even though the underlying uh, cell automata rule is uh, reversible, it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem reversible. And because there seems to be an increased increase in irreversibility or randomness. But you can run the process in reverse and find this exact initial condition uh, going like this. And we come back here, find the initial condition that give rise to, to this pattern and this reversible pattern. Um, uh, however, then he says that initial conditions like these, given reversibility, actually never occurs in practice, uh, even though nothing actually prevents reversibility from existing. And he argues that uh, we only see increased uh, in randomness is due to the fact that practical experiments almost inevitably end up involving simple initial conditions. Uh, since uh, experiments set up to observe a phenomenon uh, should be simpler than the process that the experiment is intended to observe. And why does he argue it like this? Well, it concerns his view, uh, his view of processes as a computation, and that complex behavior obtained from simple rules and initial condition uh, cannot be reduced from complex to simple and this due to his principle of computational equivalence, which states that um, that uh, simple that is not obviously simple cannot uh, be viewed um, can be viewed as uh, as a computation of equivalent sophistication. And this basically means that simple rules giving rise to complexity cannot give rise to more complexity if the rule is made more complex. Basically, what this means is that um, there's no procedure to trace backwards. Uh, this, to this initial condition given rise to reversibility, this due to complexity. Uh, an example of this is the rule 30, which uh, every time it's wrong gives the exact same pattern, so obviously it would be able to go backwards, but in order to know, um, to reduce an arbitrary run rule 30, you need to know how many steps were taken. And so this, so we just look at this and any, any time step and reduce it is not possible. And in a more general case, given complexity, um, which rule causing this 